to So good, uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, uh, whatever time you have there where you are. Uh, I'm based in Sweden, so for me it is 10 o'clock p.m. So it is a good evening from my side. Um, I am Ebba Janelson. I will be the chair for this uh, session, webinar number 11, Building Capacity, Developing Supportive Policy. And before I introduce uh, the speakers, I know many of you who are in this, uh, speakers in this uh, session, but I will also um, like to introduce myself. I am a professor in innovation in open online learning, and um, I'm an independent consultant, researcher, review, quality reviewer um, in the field of open and flexible business learning, and uh, of course, OER and open education. In Sweden, I'm the vice president for the Swedish Association for Distance Education. Uh, I am, as many of you know, um, in the ICD board and also share uh, the chair for the third mandate period for the ICD OER Advocacy Committee. So I'm an ambassador for OER with ICDE. I'm also in the ICD board and also in the ICD quality network. Uh, I'm also working for um, uh, International Council on Batches and uh, Credentials, a rather new uh, council, uh, started this uh, year actually, or 2020, sorry. And in Europe, I'm in the European Distance e uh, and E-Learning Network. So I'm involved in more or less uh, in all the international organizations and uh, a board member with, with them. I have my university experiences, mainly from Lund University here in Sweden, but also from uh, many other other universities where I work as a consultant. So it's a great pleasure for me to um, to share this uh, session we, we have, where we have a very interesting um, five present, presenters presentations uh, with very interesting presentation presenters. So um, <clears throat> those webinars are organized like that that we take all the uh, the sessions in a row. I know that there have been some differences. Uh, I have myself experienced that uh, during those uh, two days, but it was suggested from the guidelines that uh, we take all the presentations in a row, and then we have um, the last uh, minutes for a common discussion because maybe some of the presentations are overlapping each other, so we can have maybe longer and deeper, deeper um, conversations, and it's also more easy to um, to catch up with the time spots we have. So each of you, you have uh, 20 minutes. And then we, we have the last minutes, as I said, for the discussion. Um, I'm not sure if you have done it already. You will present if you have uploaded your slides in, um, in the um, um, connector area. If not, please uh, do, do so, because I know that um, participants will have a look uh, even afterwards. Um, so it would be a great uh, resource to, to collect everything there. It is very easy to just uh, do it and uh, you do it in the, in the platform and you just uh, put the link where you have the slides. And yes, uh, Lisa remind, reminded us that we have the chat. Um, and as usually, uh, please just introduce yourself where, where you are from. And also, if you have any questions, uh, put your questions um, in the chat. So I will try to keep an eye on that. Uh, do we have the rapporteur here in the uh, here in the in the room? I haven't seen any so far. Mm -hmm. No one. Okay. So I uh, I will try to to um, check the chat and. Um, Yes, anything else to think about before we get started? Uh, the webinars are recorded, uh, as you know, <laughs> and um, yeah, I think we have done all the practical uh, things now. So again, a warm welcome to each, uh, each and everyone attending this uh, webinar. I see we have now 38 participants. Um, and a special welcome, of course, to the speakers. 
and the co-authors for the presentations. So we start with um, uh, Rory McGreal from Athabasca in Canada, who is a UNESCO OER chair. And uh, you, Rory, will talk about blockchain and OER. So with that, uh, I would uh, like to give the floor to you. So a warm welcome to you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, Eba. Can you see my slides okay? Yes, they are perfect. Okay, I'll start off then. Uh, um, it's good to be here and it's great to be at another uh, OE Global uh, conference. Uh, and uh, sorry we can't meet uh, all together, but uh, um, I'm sure most of us are going to survive this in any case. So today I'm going to talk about two things, why OER are good for blockchain and why blockchain is good for open educational resources. And to start off, just to let you know, all these slides are under Creative Commons Attribution License. However, some of the e images are under Fair Dealing in Canada or Fair Use in uh, the US and other jurisdictions. So just uh, to be aware of that. Um, first, I'm going to tell you what blockchain is. I'm assuming that everyone does not have a full grip on it. And so the short form version is that it's a distributed ledger that provides a way for information to be recorded and shared by a, by a community. So the community could be the accreditors, the institutions, the employers, uh, the students and or the teachers. And uh, they use the blockchain uh, in order to uh, uh, communicate uh, information. And it can be a public blockchain or it can be a private blockchain. So I think everyone here knows what a ledger is and that's a typical old fashioned ledger. Uh, the key difference with the blockchain is that it's a distributed ledger and it involves multiple copies of the ledger stored on different computers. And the best example, the best known example of uh, the use of blockchain is of course, Bitcoin. And again, this is based on this distributed ledger and it's a specific kind of distributed le ledger called a blockchain. I'll be talking about blockchain for education today for open education resources and not making any further references uh, to Bitcoin and uh, uh, that application of blockchain. So we can say it's a distributed lecture. It's not controlled by anyone. It's shared in a person to person network and it can be accessible from any node on the network. It facilitates two or, two or more people to collaborate among themselves without the need for a centralized authority. The records are validated in blocks and each new block contains a hash of previous block, creating a chain. Altering earlier blocks alters the hash and breaks the chain and a typical chain is uh, put down below. So it's uh, uh, very difficult uh, to break into or to decipher. So what happens on the blockchain stays on the blockchain. So once it's on there, it's there forever. It can't be deleted or changed. Transactions are easily traced. It's organized chronologically. So the, the first one, the first block is always there. The second block is put on top, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and they're all time stamped, So you know when the block was created and it, it renders it so as there's no need for a third party to verify it. So it works as a secure private network uh, on decentralized exchanges. It supports identity verification and secure certification, for example, credits at a university. It enha has enhanced performance and it's scalable up to uh, 
millions and more users. So the way it works is uh, explained in this chart from Amir Rosik. Uh, uh, so you want to send money to a friend. It creates a block. The block is broadcast to every party in the network. Those in the network approve the transaction and validate it. They basically say this is a real transaction. The block is then added to the chain, which provides a permanent non-repudiable and that's important, non-repudiable. You cannot change it ever. And transparent record of the transaction. And then in the Bitcoin analysis, Ben uh, receives the money from Alice. So what we're talking about, a blockchain, the main features are it's decentralized, it's distributed, it's immutable, it's secure, and it's time-stamped. However, there are some problems with blockchain. It's a big system and any big system, as it gets bigger, you can have unexpected failures. Another problem in implementing blockchain is if your present system is working, um, maybe not working at optimum performance, but working, why change it? And another big problem, and maybe one of the biggest problems for blockchain is that the encryption is permanent. So you need a key to access your blockchain. And if you lose the key, it is gone forever. No one can access uh, that blockchain at that point. Other problems is persistence. And uh, what we were saying uh, before about you can't change it. Even fake content can stay there forever, or illegal content, or just unwanted content. You may have had uh, uh, something you put on a blockchain in the past. You don't want anyone to know about it. It's always there. Um, leaked personal data that somebody else might put on about you. It's always there. So these are significant problems. Other problems, technical, is uh, the network maintenance costs can be quite big. The transaction speed can be very slow. In the case of Bitcoin, it takes minutes uh, quite often um, for one simple transaction. Storage, uh, it's stored all around the world and uh, different places have different storage regimes. Um, the threat of regulatory intervention is real, um, that uh, the governments are gonna come in and, uh, and take control over it. And of course, hackers, uh, uh, there have been some cases of hacking of the blockchain. <clears throat> One of the biggest problems that's mentioned by people about blockchain is that of energy use. And the idea of, uh, a uh, blockchain on a, on a public blockchain um, using a proof of work. There are different types of uh, ways of implementing blockchain. Proof of work, proof of stake, proof of authority, proof of identity. And as you can see, um, a simple server uses very little energy. But once you get into a centralized system, it's more energy. And the enterprise blockchain, um, uh, which, which would be the one that uh, I would think being used in open education resources, um, uses more. And the other bigger ones are public uh, blockchain that isn't proof of work, and finally the other. So there are major problems still with energy use that have to be resolved. Now, I won't at this, uh, conference tell you what open educational resources are. So why do we need OER for blockchain? Well, scalability, accessibility, DRM, and digital licenses, or in calling it digital rights management, I pre prefer to call it digital restrictions management. 
So we can have a global knowledge commons where the institutions provide long-term access to and preservation of content and researchers and research communities provide the content uh, for peer review. And with scalable solutions, it's only possible with open data or OER, OA or OS. When you're talking about international collaborations um, without open education resources, without open licenses, it becomes very problem problematic and very difficult. Even you put it on a blockchain, this blockchain, well, this can't be used in this country, can't be used in that country because of the international differences in copyright. And so there are exponential problems with licensing. If you put any kind of restrictive license on, a, on content, it becomes very difficult if it starts being used by multiple users in multiple jurisdictions. So OER can be a major benefit for blockchain. The benefits of blockchain are best achieved through open implementations. And uh, the open source industry has blockchain. So it, uh, it takes in uh, industry standards, uh, the blockchain protocols and industry blockchains. And they can all be connected together if they're openly licensed. Access and affordability. It needs to be inexpensive when it's needed by the learner. And again, open education resources free, uh, a uh, blockchain that is free is essential. And we all know that commercial content is not our property. Digital rights management, these locks they put on our app on, uh, con on uh, a commercial content, um, they own and control their content. We don't. They own the content, they control it. And it's as we say, no one controls it with blockchain. How can we use commercial content on there? And of course, we've had uh, some major problems with the commercial content and putting digital locks onto operating systems. And uh, there's some that we remember from about 10, 10 or 12 years ago, the great Amazon purge and Google's removal of an animal farm, et cetera. So digital rights management software needs deep permissions into the operating system, and it can stop normal operating system functions. So it's very difficult to implement these using a blockchain. And of course, digital licenses prohibit you by law from doing this. Um, owners don't have any liability. Uh, they, can use, uh, they can use the product however they want, not however you want. And you have a privilege to use the product. You don't own it. So I'll quote uh, David Wiley here that the openness is the skeleton key that unlocks every attempt at vendor control and lock-in. And so OER for blockchain, um, it becomes a huge facilitator of using blockchain. Now, why blockchain for OER? Well, here are some faculty concerns about OER that we've heard um, that they're not being attributed, that they're disregarding open co copyright requirements. So if they put an ND license on it, people disregard it uh, or um, non-commercial or even SA, they disregard it. Uh, they misuse the public work. Um, the sustainability of the OER, they're very concerned about it, that uh, it can stay on and be used and accessible. And faculty do not like to pay predatory publishers for the privilege of publishing in open with an open license. Other concerns, they want their records secured and permanent. 
for example, institutions can disappear. And we see that happening that now with the many institutions uh, not surviving the COVID epidemic. Um, there's an OER networks for scholars. The records are almost incorruptible and changes can be tracked. And this is, these are all addressed by blockchain. Secure records, a good network of OER, the records are incorruptible. They will always know who created the object and what the original license was. And these changes, any changes can be tracked. Every single change can be tracked. But uh, problems from OER, well, there's high operational costs, um, insufficient copyright protection. There's barriers to sharing resources and uh, quite often with the poor resource quality. So the solutions to some of these OER problems that blockchain brings is tracking and tracing. You know, every time the, uh, every time the object is changed, proper attribution, attribution goes with the blockchain right to the very end of the chain. Sustainability, it lasts there forever, persistent. Blockchains are persistent. Publishing time, the time stamp, make sure that everyone knows where it's come, when it's coming from. And there is no single point of failure because it's distributed on the network. So some of the advantages are there, the self-sovereignty, that is people using the blockchain, they're independent, they're self-sovereign. You can trust the blockchain. Uh, the provenance, you know the provenance where it came from. It's transparent, available to all to see. It's immutable. Again, I've mentioned this is not always good, but uh, for most instances, it being unchangeable is important. And by unchangeable means you can change and adapt it, uh, but the older version always remains there. Each change brings a new version with a timestamp. Uh, disintermediation, it means you don't need a central authority and it enables collaboration internationally and between institutions. <clears throat> so blockchain addresses three problems that OER have. Quite often too many, and this is a big problem for OER, they're hidden from view and inaccessible. People can't find them. OER on the web, they lack permanence. They come and they go. People put them up and the, the uh, URL changes, the institution changes, they clean up the website, they're not permanent. And quite often, Creative Commons IP is not recognized, that people do not recognize the restrictions that some authors put on them. Uh, with blockchain, we know who they are and when they did it. So it eliminates the need for centralized repositories and plagiarism becomes obsolete. Because if you change something and pretend that it's yours, the blockchain can go back and show that it wasn't you. Other things, OER records secured and permanent. It puts in the publication date, the location, authorship. Any change in a transaction gives a new value. The change requires consensus. Every node must accept it. And the author is always attributed. OER files will also include attribution. There's less resistance to remixing OER because of this. OER records are permanent regardless of changes. OER publishing networks can be created by scholars and OER records will be almost incorruptible. So the process is outlined here where we can create, adopt and share our uh, open educational resources. 
and we can find, find them, evaluate them, edit them, enhance them, or adopt them. And uh, we can prepare them, search them, repurpose them, add value, publish them, and then they can be remade again in different blocks on the chain. So blockchain solves the centralization issue. It's distributed. It's a network of trusted entities or gatekeeping nodes. It has access to content with a public key and it's verification and validation based on quality. So it activates a decoding mechanism, which is by the way, a Creative Commons criterion. It uploads a new version and maintains trackability. It's posted on a ledger. And when CC by ND or NC, then it cannot be changed at all. So it allows the implementation of the Creative Commons licenses. OER quality and copyright um, are guarded. There's no need of centralization. It reduces the time to publication and it increases availability because it's decentralized and distributed. Now the OER distributed management platform will have user management, resource creation, resource management, copyright management, a virtual currency exchange, and learning certification management. So to conclude, blockchain loves OER and OER uh, loves blockchain. But we must know we're in the experimental stage and we have a lot to learn in implementing OER for blockchain and blockchain uh, for OER. So thank you very much for your attention. Greatly appreciate it. So thank you so much, uh, Rory. It was really, really inspiring. And uh, it brings some new perspectives as we really think for the issue of OER and how we work with OER. So let's discuss that further on, uh, but in the end of the session, there are already some questions uh, here in the chat for you. So thanks again, and uh, please remember to put your, your questions and reflections in the chat for all the speakers. So then we will move to uh, the, next, um, the next one. Uh, there are several authors, but I think it will be uh, Tal Amil uh, presenting um, um, this one. So it is Tal Amil, uh, Leonardo Rabeira de Cruz, Dariana Salas, Maria Viola, Dem Brusis, Juliana Puerta, Sub Sebastian Zapatero, and Natalia Larea Montano. Maybe not the uh, right pronunciation. I'm sorry for that. So, um, Tala Mel, Mel is also UNESCO OER here. And the um, presentation will be about surveillance, cap capitalism, and open education, large scale data from Latin America. So, the floor is yours. Uh. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, the introduction and uh, for the great company on this, uh, this panel. So, um, uh, what, what we're going to be talking about today is, is a bit of our, our uh, research uh, in the past five or six years where we've been looking at uh, the technologies that are around uh, open education and open educational resources. And I'd like to present with, to you uh, uh, some data, some new data that we just launched last month on uh, Latin America, on South America specifically, uh, and try to make the case for why uh, we have to worry as open educators uh, uh, regarding uh, issues uh, of uh, surveillance and privacy and things of the sort. So, well, the obvious thing that happened, and I'll try to not make it so obvious by talking about my neck of the woods and, and talking a bit about South America, but the obvious thing that happened over the past couple of, uh, of years is we've been in this COVID crisis, and it's uh, we know from all the reports, including some presented here at, uh, at Open Education Global, that we have um, 
uh, we've had to deal with this in, in many ways, including teacher professional development and, and getting into platforms and, and doing all sorts of, of, of uh, strategies. Uh, and in Brazil, for example, this wasn't very different. Uh, this this uh, caption here from the this uh, screen capture from the, the right uh, says that uh, the Ministry of Education in Brazil started finding uh, ways to get internet access to people with uh, with uh, uh, that didn't have a good financial means. So we, we realized that a lot of people don't have access to the internet. We realized that a lot of people don't have good access to the internet. And we had a lot of problems dealing with a lot of issues in, uh, in a new scenario where pretty much everybody had to be online to learn with the, the exception of very rare cases where we had printed materials and so forth, which is a reality in many cases or using uh, more legacy technologies like television and, and radio. So uh, often in open, we talk a lot about content, right? The OER is sort of our, our, our mainstay. We talk about OER quite a lot and that's very important. And that includes talking about licenses and repositories and services and the like. Uh, we often also talk about practices uh, and you know the things that are related to OER, but also practices that are not necessarily related to OER, but are open as well. And we talk about how we can enact these. And this has been, I think, a, a, a common topic in, in many of our discussions and they're incredibly important. But we talk less, and uh, this is uh, this is coming to be important now because of the pandemic. We talk less about tools, and we talk less about the technology that surrounds this uh, environment of open. And I think it's important to realize that we've you know we've we've always talked a bit about it in terms of repositories and the like. And Rory just talked about blockchain and applications. But uh, I think one of the things we we need to do more now because of the scenario that we're in is to think about the the overall ecosystem of technologies that supports open. And that's uh, an important part of, of the OER recommendation is that it goes beyond some of the more common themes that we talk about and includes, for example, a discussion on one of the elements that I want to bring forward here, which is this idea of uh, when we design policies, when we design for OER and for open education in general, we need to be uh, worried about infrastructure and related services and we need to worry about data protection. And so this is not lost, I think, in the uh, in the in, in the overall you know, zeitgeist of open education today, and including in the recommendation from UNESCO that came out in 2019. So, what is what is sort of the the issue at hand? What is what are we worried about, and what's what are some of the concerns? So, uh, around the world, but especially in in poorer countries during the pandemic, we have found that a lot of educational systems have looked for support in getting their their. Uh, their students online, their students and their teachers online, and they turn to basically two large corporations. Uh, one of them is Microsoft, offering a service called Microsoft 365, or used to be known as Office 365. These names change every two months or so. And also Google with uh, Google Suite or Google Classroom, or now Google Workspace for Education, have been two of these very big platforms that have uh, entered the, the educational space. Uh, exponentially during the COVID crisis, but also uh, have been demanded by educational systems and institutions. And they are part of this acronym that's called GAFAM, Google, Apple, Facebook, uh, Amazon, and Microsoft that are, I think, well known. Uh, and they are these uh, intermediators. They're, they're, they are these, these entities that stand between the promise of a disintermediated internet. Uh, it's basically impossible to do anything online, starting with your cell phone, which is owned either by the operating systems, either owned by Google or Apple. It's very hard for anybody to do anything educational that doesn't involve one of these five entities and just general life without these five entities. I won't spend too much time to, to this uh, effect because I think it's it's common knowledge now. We've, we've been alerted over this uh, of this issue for the past few years. But let me talk about why we think this is a problem for open education before I show you some of the data that I want to share with you. So I want to share uh, three basic problems, which I think are incredibly important for us. Uh, and one of them is reducing choice and platform agnosticism. So the idea of open standards and open formats and open tools is a really important part for us uh, in open education. We want to be able to choose and to move freely. Uh, we don't want to lock students into platforms. We don't want to lock students into systems. And what we've seen, particularly in the, in the area in, in Latin America and investment in education is, is that economic policies uh, uh, that reduce spending in education have made uh, IT management and the IT infrastructures in institutions and in uh, school systems in the region uh, become downsized, and it has favored the growth of this educational technology market, which has been only very happy to join in 
and take over this, this space. And this is a citation from, from an article from one of our colleagues that's a co-author here, uh, where we were st studying uh, higher education institutions in the region. So downsizing and reducing uh, uh, expenditures in education leads to uh, uh, quickly to uh, reduce the investment in IT and uh, essential services that are then uh, given up to, to the, the private market. Uh, we have also uh, conducted a lot of interviews with folks in, in uh, IT and uh, educational institutions. And I'll just put some of these uh, very small findings here to, to highlight some of the problems is, is uh, if we're interested in, in, in open and uh, one of the consequences of downsizing is that a lot of the initiatives that are around free and open source software, which are an important element of open education, get downsized and they lose. So one of the rhetoric, one of the elements of the rhetoric around adoption of these platforms is that it's just another initiative, it's another source, it's another LMS, it's another system that can coexist with others. But what we've been finding here is that uh, a lot of uh, the open source uh, uh, initiatives that exist in, in institutions uh, slowly dissipate when uh, other uh, private initiatives come into play. So it's not exactly a level playing field, even though the quality of the offerings might be uh, better for floss or at least just as good. So this is just a, a quick sentence from an interview with one of these uh, uh, IT folks from universities that says, you know, what led to the closing of the FLOSS initiative? And it was a very clear uh, uh, response. You know, the partnership with the, the university with Microsoft led us to close down our, our free and open source initiatives. Uh, another way in which we reduce choice and, and agnosticism is that we become as slaves to platforms as a service or PAFAS where basically an institution or a, an educational system only controls data and some of the applications that are used, but everything else is managed externally. Uh, and this is another quote from one of the uh, TIT administrators that says, basically without the pandemic, we would not be using Office 365. So there's been a, a huge move to these platforms uh, into, into private uh, uh, corporations because of the pandemic as well. And they lead to the, the kinds of things we were mentioning earlier. Uh, finally, uh, there is uh, this, this uh, idea uh, the reducing choice agnosticism is also related to the idea of zero rating, and that's particularly uh, problematic for uh, poor nations. So the idea of zero rating is that once you reach a quota of access to the internet, which is a common thing for poor nations, uh, you get a free uh, access to certain uh, systems. So you may, may have free access to WhatsApp or you may have free access to Facebook, but ironically, you might not have free access to your own institutional website. So you might get access to, to, to WhatsApp, but not to say your university site, for example. And so uh, uh, what is, when, when you get these, this free or zero rating access, you have uh, free access to certain things, but not others. And that also reduces choice and concentrates people on the same set of platforms and services. And so we've been seeing these things happen uh, that slowly reduce the options that universities and school systems have and concentrate us around platforms from private corporations. And that is, uh, should be a, a huge problem for us as open educators. The second thing is, is platform loyalty, which is related to the first, but a little bit different in the sense that you get people to be uh, accustomed to using only a particular service to the point where they don't even know others exist. And that to us as open educators is a huge problem because again, we're interested in opening up possibilities and not concentrating them as much. And usually when I speak about this, I needed a, you know, a lot to talk about this, but I have been blessed with one phrase from the director for education from Google in Brazil. And he kind of explains what we always knew in one very simple phrase, which is an advantage of offering the service to schools is to promote loyalty early on. And uh, as again, as open educators, this idea of promoting loyalty to Google for eight-year-olds or nine-year-olds should be something that scares us quite a bit because what we're basically doing is concentrating uh, all our educational tools and systems in one platform that's going to be uh, a platform for life, basically, if you get uh, children fairly young involved in these platforms. The third, which is, is probably the, the, the most uh, important one for us is the idea of losing control of our technology and also uh, losing control of privacy. And uh, most people don't read uh, terms of use, uh, but uh, eventually we have to. And so we did this uh, analysis for Google Suite for Education and Microsoft 365, published a large report on it. And one of the things which I think is, is really quite important for educators is this idea that uh, institutions and school systems often uh, they often give out uh, this this uh, essential control to to these these uh, businesses in uh, in thinking that these uh, that Microsoft or Google are going to be responsible for everything and they don't have anything to worry about. 
but uh, truthfully, uh, is it's uh, this is not quite the case. Uh, these platforms are only responsible to a certain degree, and the school systems and institutions are also a client and they're a data controller. So they're co-responsible for a lot of things. And one example of this is that they're responsible for getting permission for, for uh, 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 children to join the platform. So they have to, as a school systems and institutions to get permission. And a lot of them don't know this as we've seen this in the pandemic here where schools and, and, and institutions put everybody online and only six months or seven months later, we're asking permission from parents to put the, the kids online. And this is a, a huge problem. And just to exemplify this, we've done a very large uh, Freedom of Information Act or in Brazil it's called LIE request to every institution in Brazil in higher education and public higher education. That's about 140 of them. And uh, uh, one of the typical answers that we get is uh, the institute or the university does not have agreement with Google or Microsoft. And then the second answer is we use Google for education and also Microsoft 365 because it's free of charge. And this brings up one of the very important elements for us as open educators, which is this idea that because it is free, there's really nothing for us to worry about. Right? And this is a very common perception, even with high level administrators, because we've gotten something for free, there are no commitments, we have nothing to worry about. So do we have an agreement? No, not really, it's free. So there's nothing to, nothing to think about. And that's, a, of course, a paradox and, and, a, and, a, and a problem. Finally, uh, to, to, to wrap up these, these points, uh, the, the final one, which I think is really important for us to think about as open educators, is how these platforms are uh, controlling also our common goods. So, you know, uh, the commons is a very important aspect of what we do in terms of open education, creating space for commons, not only for collaboration, but for resources. So when Amazon comes up with something that is already kind of dead, which is Inspire, where they say you can post your online content here, uh, we have to worry about where we're posting our OER. The same thing goes for a Google Drive or, or uh, any other place where you post your content massively. Uh, thinking about what these platforms mean and how, whether your content's going to last and whether they're going to be available in the future. And, and remembering that these free platforms are commercial platforms really makes us think whether this is related to open or if it's just a free initiative. And this is particularly important now for us during the pandemic because we know that students are, are heavily involved in these platforms. Uh, so we know from surveys here, a national survey here in, in Brazil that's done every year for the past 11 years, that students in 2019, a lot of them had profiles in many of these platforms. And just as an example, 61% of them say that they use WhatsApp for educational activities. So they actually use it in, in schools with teachers, which shows how much of this is appropriated within the educational system. So for about five years now, we had this, this observatory, which is called the Surveillance and Education Observatory, and that's the, the site, uh, Educação Vigiada in Portuguese, where we map uh, these partnerships. So we, we've gathered data uh, on, on these partnerships in the region, and only last month we launched uh, data from every public higher education institution in South America. And so from this very simple map, and you can navigate the map better in our site, you can have an idea of the reds are partnerships with Google and Microsoft, and the greens are uh, are other systems which are normally maintained by the institutions. And just to give you some idea, I won't go through too much detail. It's better to look at the map and you can click on every point and see all the details. Uh, if you look at all 448 institutions in the region, nearly 80% of them are already either Google or Microsoft. So the adoption of an email service is a very strong indicator that every other service is already uh, controlled by Google and Microsoft as well, such as an LMS or, or something like that. Uh, and so 80% of the institutions in the region, and that in some countries is even more drastic. So if you look at, at Colombia, for example, out of 75 institutions, only one institution is not served by Google or Microsoft. And um, this data in Peru is, is similar. If you look at the map, it kind of gives you a, an idea. And only two institutions out of 64 are not served by uh, Google or Microsoft as well. And this shows it should kind of be scary in a sense, because what we're saying is that the place where we get things done uh, in, in education is now controlled by two very big, large corporations in a, in a whole country. Um, in Brazil, we have more detailed data, and we know by looking at not only uh, uh, higher education and public institutions, but also school systems at the state level and municipalities with over 500,000 uh, inhabitants, 66% of all of these are already Google or Microsoft. So that shows that we have kids at a very young age already being co-opted by these systems. So uh, some of the consequences of this, which I think are important. 
One is to think about you know, what, what after COVID will digital learning be uh, the new normal? Uh, what kind of uh, legacy are we leaving post COVID for educational technology uh, in these schools? Who controls the content we create, the platforms we use to communicate and where we do our teaching, whatever hybrid sort of model might emerge after COVID. Um, and I, I bring back a phrase from a colleague, uh, Eva Terhar, which is, uh, I think, a very, very powerful phrase. It says that just because we claim openness, just because we say we are open, it doesn't automatically uh, call into being a natural, neutral or a progressive space free of political tensions. You know, the choices that we make as, as managers, educational managers, administrators, but also educators, really uh, really uh, open us up to having our values of, of open being subverted. And these technological choices are, I think, a really great example of this. Just being open on Google uh, doesn't necessarily make you very progressive. One of the most important things we've been talking about uh, quite a bit is this idea that we must insist on, on uh, educating between the difference between free and open. And that is a problem for high level administrators at a university. It's a problem with teachers. It's a problem with students. People I still don't know and don't understand the difference between free and open. And that's a big problem related to technology. And, you know, taking up the centenary of Paulo Freire here, I can not mention him. And, and he has this very powerful phrase that he said many, many years ago, uh, for me, the question is in whose service these machines are. He's not against it, but he wants to know who is who. Who are they serving? And generally, generally, free things are not serving you. They're serving somebody else, and it's important for us to to realize this. That there is no such thing as free, and I think that's been a, a discussion I've seen in many of the OEC talks I've been uh, participating so far. Is that we know that even open has a cost, and we have to know where the costs are. You know, wh who's paying for what, who's benefiting from what, and we have to be much more alert and educate people about these things as well. And realize that there are, uh, there's a, a power imbalance in, in, in working with free. The free creates hierarchies, you know, you're, you're, you're a slave to certain platforms. It constrains and conditions practice. It provides you with only certain tools and only certain ways you can use them. It doesn't allow you to extract data in a way that's appropriate for you to move somewhere else. It doesn't necessarily work with open formats. Uh, it, it, it allows you to get in, but makes it very hard for you to get out. And if you have to get out, you have to pay somehow. Or if you want more, you have to pay. Um, these imbalances are inherent there, but also inherent in practice. Uh, when we condition people and we force people to join platforms, like saying, let's create a WhatsApp group, or uh, you're going to host your site on Google uh, Sites, for example, uh, you're inclining on people. You're sort of telling them that this is what they have to do. They might not determine, people might find alternatives, but as educators, as administrators, we have a certain power over people. And it's important to realize when we're, we're inclining on them technologically as well, making decisions for them that don't really allow them to make real choices. Uh, and finally, I think the most important thing is that uh, we lose a valuable opportunity to, to realize that as open educators, we're not stuck with the technological systems that we have. We can participate, we can be part of this, we can create new technological feature, features and futures. Uh, and it, it's, it's okay to be a user, but it's very bad to just be a user all the time. So we have to realize that we can be part of this. And to wrap up uh, a final message, which I think is important, is uh, that there is no education without technology, especially now, I think we finally come to this realization and, and that open education cannot uh, ignore this, this theme of digital rights. And we cannot stop thinking, uh, ignore the idea of thinking of, of, of technologies as a core part of every aspect from the development to implementation of, of open education. And so uh, we have to put the digital rights agenda as the OER recommendation uh, declares, we have to put that into our discussions of, of our open technologies as well. So thank you very much. And I'll uh, remain here for comments and questions. Thanks again. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tal. It was really, really interesting. And um, you brought up a lot of new questions, which is very important to, to reflect on and think about what is free and what is open and how how is that connected? And uh, I also agree that technology is maybe not so much uh, discussed, but hopefully, hopefully we can discuss that uh, more later on in the end of this session. So please um, uh, write your reflections and questions for, for Tal and his team about this uh, topic. So um, now we move further on. And the next um, presentation is uh, from uh, T.G. Bliss and Jonathan Lashley. Um, and their topic is uh, Look Around You, a model for developing open education policy at the regional level. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eva. 
Uh, greetings, everyone. I'm TJ Bliss, and you'll see Jonathan Lashley perhaps on the screen as well. But in case not, here's a picture of us. Jonathan's is the sharp, clear one. Mine is the grainy one. And uh, I'm the Chief Academic Officer at the state, uh, the Office of the State Board of Education in Idaho. And Jonathan Lashley is, is my Associate Chief Academic Officer here. And before we <clears throat> jump into OER policy, at the regional level, we want to help you understand the region we're talking about. The region we're discussing is, is at the state level in the United States of America. So some background on, on Idaho which many of you may not even know where Idaho is because many uh, Americans don't even know where Idaho is. Is it Ohio or Iowa or is it Idaho, Ohio? No, it's Idaho. It's where most of your potatoes come from. Idaho is in the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest. It borders Washington and Oregon and Nevada. Uh, it's fairly close to California, too close to California for some people in Idaho, I think. And it is not Iowa or Ohio. So those are also great states. The governance of Idaho, like most other, I think every other state in the United States uh, has three, three uh, branches of government. There's the governor in the middle here, represented by this icon. There's a legislature of elected representatives, and then there's a Supreme Court. And in Idaho, uh, the legislature creates laws and provides and distributes funding, authorizes funding to education. And a lot of the laws that the legislature passes relate to education and most of the funding that our, our legislature uh, gives out is for educational purposes. There's also a, in the constitution of Idaho, there is a, a, the, there's a state board of education uh, that consists of eight people. Seven of those people are appointed by the governor who is elected. One of the members of this board is actually elected um, in the general election and becomes the superintendent or secretary of education and oversees primary and secondary education or K-12 education. The board in its entirety in Idaho is, is almost unique in the United States in that the Idaho Board of Education oversees all public education in the state from kindergarten through all of higher education or post-secondary education. There's only one other state in the United States that has a board like that. Most states have two or more boards. Uh, California probably has six or seven boards, it feels like, uh, that oversee their education system. But in Idaho is one board that oversees them all. And another unique uh, aspect of the State Board of Education in Idaho is that the State Board has legal authority to create and adopt policies that govern a lot of the higher education or post-secondary education that happens in the state. And I'll talk a little bit more about, about that here. So in Idaho, there are eight public post-secondary uh, in institutions. And there are several private uh, institutions as well that have some regulate the board oversees in some regulatory fashion, but, but the policies of the board um, over, uh, directly impact the institutions and are binding as law on our public post-secondary institutions, especially our four-year institutions, the University of Idaho, Boise State University, Idaho State University, and Lewis Clark State College. Those four universities and our three universities and, and one college, all of the policies of the board are governing and binding on them as, as equal to the law of the legislature. The community colleges are a little bit different. They have their own local boards. And so only some of the policies that the board enacts are governing over the community colleges. All of the laws that come from the legislature govern uh, all of the institutions as they pertain to them. So understanding how this structure is set up, I think, is important for understanding the role that, that Jonathan and I play. As the, as the chief academic officer and associate chief academic officer, we serve as executive staff to the State Board of Education. We are not elected officials. But being in a small state, uh, the board are appointed volunteers. It's not their full-time job. They, they um, enact policy and adopt them formally, but it, it generally falls on board staff to create those policies and, and draft them and bring them to the board. So we have a lot, a, a big role to play in bringing forth good or bad, for good or better policies to the board. And Jonathan's gonna take it from here and talk about a little bit of history uh, of policy related to open educational resources and instructional materials in Idaho and the role that, uh, that we've played and, and how we've developed a model that we, we think is, is worth considering as you think about policy development in your own regions. So I'll advance slides for you, Jonathan, go ahead. 
Thanks, TJ. And I just want to take a point of personal privilege and say I'm really excited to be here. This is my first time uh, presenting for OE Global. And I appreciate and admire so much of what uh, others on this, this session, uh, what they work on and what they do. And I agree, uh, TJ and I, we have seen, as he said, um, good and bad policy as it relates to OER in our state. And naturally these have emerged in recent years. Go ahead and switch to the next slide, TJ. Here's an example of a, uh, a, a, a favorable policy, let's call it that, or rather this is some legislation that came from our legislature back in 2019, where they wanted to dedicate $50,000 in one-time funding to support uh, open educational resource projects that span multiple institutions, that uh, targeted specific high impact courses, uh, for many of you in the States at least, high impact courses are often seen as synonymous with general education courses. Those large seats, uh, multi-section, tend to be textbook reliant courses that are taught in the first couple of years of college. And uh, what's important here and why we emphasize it is a few of the, the features as well as some of the barriers that exist in Idaho as it relates to OER policy, but also education policy more generally. Uh, next slide. So uh, as TJ outlined, we have this sort of cunning K-20 structure of overlapping governance where the board has quite a bit of influence, um, though it's not exhaustive. However, because we have a really small education community, our, our, our full-time enrollment statewide in higher ed is around 56,000, uh, it means that folks tend to know one another, uh, have, have maybe crossed paths or collaborated in the past. Uh, many of those collaborations have been sponsored by a shared general education framework that we have. We have um, on the books 43 general education courses that are common numbered, common indexed across our institutions to support transfer as well as um, curriculum development, learning outcomes, and ultimately institutions supporting one another in the provisioning of general education. Also, uh, we have fairly collaborative faculty and staff. I'm a little bit biased because I've, I've worked in the education community in Idaho, so has TJ though. And you're hard pressed to find people who are more passionate about what they do, especially because uh, as we'll see on the next slide, you don't always have the resources and so you have to lean on others. But importantly, uh, and, and this is reflected in that legislation as well, there is a persuasive appeal of operating like a system even though we're not an official system of higher education. Uh, it's, it comes down to the shrewd pragmatism of consolidating resources and cutting costs where appropriate, but ultimately, in order to scale and be well supported in our practices, we need to share well and, and wide. Next slide. Uh, so there are some key barriers that we also navigate both with our, our OER policies as well as um, general academic policies. One is because we're not a system, participa participation is not always assured. Um, a lot of our initiatives, a lot of our working collaboratively statewide, it really depends on people uh, being committed, having um, a, a place of safety and security in their work, as well as intrinsic and extrinsic motivation to uh, persist and, and work with us. Also, um, very important, as we've come to realize over the last two years since TJ and I have entered into this work, uh, it's easy for our faculty and staff to be overextended with their obligations. And especially when we look at the community colleges where they are um, not only in, in a, a position of shared governance with local boards, as well as our state board, they often have the fewest resources and need the most support and their faculty and staff tend to wear the most hats, have the most responsibilities in a, a variety of overlapping and sometimes not overlapping areas. Also, generally with any sort of emerging topics or um, as, as we found repeatedly in conversations with faculty, areas where they might not feel um, particularly supported by their institution, by their colleagues or their peers, um, open education for many of us who do advocacy work in the state, the, the golden ticket is finding really clear and uh, meaningful relationships with tenure and promotion processes um, to shore up and show that the work that can be done um, either in OER or other emergent teaching and learning trends, that it is valuable, that it is scholarly, that it is worth rewarding. Uh, but those structures seldom exist. 
And uh, as is also, I think, evidenced by that earlier piece of legislation, $50,000 can go fairly far in a state like Idaho. However, it was one-time funding. And it's hard to build a program when you don't know where the next 50K is going to come. It's also hard to build a program that can scale when you doubt you're going to be able to get more than 50K to support eight institutions. Next slide. And then there are policies that can um, emerge from within the house, the, the threat coming from inside. And right before I started with the board office and about four months before TJ started, uh, the former chief academic officer had developed a policy uh, around OER and for lack of better phrasing, it was developed in a vacuum. It was, it was a, a solitary act that worked with um, the board members who were interested in seeing OER policy come forward. They really wanted to see it take off at our institutions. But as someone who was coming from one of our institutions and someone who had been really active in the open education conversations in our state, I knew that OER had already taken off and that we had a really rich and vibrant culture around open um, pedagogical approaches, practices, OER, uh, better use of library resources. It was a much more vibrant um, map of options and practices and shared strategies than what ultimately was reflected in, in what was labeled Board Policy 3U. Um, and a few of the issues with this policy are common with other early open education policies that we've seen in the States. The idea that you need to have some sort of arbitrary metric. In this case, it was also leveraging, again, that common general education framework, but, real, but, but trying to say that the ultimate outcome would be having at least one section of every general education course at every institution be entirely OER based, um, as if there is some unique and scalable and inherent value in that. But furthermore, and, and to, uh, I guess, to the discredit of, of those who authored this original policy, they knew full well that what this also did was overlook all of the work, good work that was already happening on the ground. And so if you want to switch to the next slide, TJ, what it failed to consult was what was happening on the ground at our institutions. Um, and so it's, it's easy to say they kind of fit this three-part model where you have, um, at some place it's starting, uh, usually it's not starting with implementation, but the board office drafting a policy, usually because uh, they were asked to do so by the board uh, to fit some specific goal or priority. Uh, TJ and I came in and assessed the situation pretty, pretty quickly and, and looking at policy 3U asked ourselves, uh, to what end do we have any of these requirements or expectations for our institutions? Um, and, and that led us to ask questions about, well, what was the influence on the board? Uh, where were they getting their information? Where did they see the specific strategy and need as, as omnipresent, at least to such a degree that need to be shored up in board policy? Um, and ultimately, we need to know those two things in order to help the institutions um, implement policy. However, in, in the past, and this was very much the case with the early release of Policy 3U, What's help with implementation looked like was fairly nebulous. Uh, my position specifically was created in 2019 to better support institutions on implementation of board policy. But effectively, what breaks down here is that this whole model is really built on awareness being something that can be cultivated. Ideally, it's that your policy would be so plain spoken that everyone would be aware of what it means. But without someone actively shepherding that awareness, uh, it's likely missing from the equation. Next slide. And so we got into a position very early on in our ten years with the board office of pursuing policy redevelopment around 3U specifically. And this model that we developed kind of in flight as a design process has now extended, and in ways I'll share with you momentarily, to really all academic policy pursuits. Next slide. And we, we coined, or I coined this acronym um, off of this initial work on Policy 3U, but TJ, you're welcome to disagree with me if you think that this also doesn't scale to some of our other work with academic policies. Uh, ideally, we're focused on four things. We're focused on openness in the process. How can we make sure that we're engaging with all of those who have a certain degree of affinity or inquiry around the topics that we're building policy around? Uh, and, and with 3U, it was making sure that there were opportunities for folks to get involved in co-authoring 
And some of that came from staging not only regular office hours with faculty and faculty senates and others, but also um, widespread forums with over 100 people who were participating to talk about exactly what we already knew, but to a much greater degree than we could anticipate of how their frustration with policy 3U is they completely dismissed the really innovative and interesting practices that they were already conducting on campus without any sort of mandate or any sort of um, reward structure. Next, focusing on pedagogy. Um, in academic affairs, we have a research priority, but at the same time, um, research and practice are, are inherently interlinked. And so making sure that uh, if there are impacts on teaching and learning that we're recognizing what the goals are at the institution level. Um, and importantly, if we were going to, to have a policy or maintain a policy around open, and I, I really love that we're following up on the last uh, panel, making sure that tools and opportunities are available, that they're interoperable as well, that they're not gonna be shackled or something that's gonna turn off in the event that we do lose funding and also exploring how we can make things interinstitutional and collaborative so that institutions can support and help scale for one another. Next is a matter of advocacy, which is in, in, in practical terms, it looked to us in terms of reviewing not only other policies from other states, but also the literature and relying on uh, mine and TJ's networks around open, but then also looking at like policies at the institutions and trying to shore up and find commonality. What we found through our review is, and, and this is probably why this model has scaled so effectively to our other academic affairs policies, is that inevitably, once we started talking about textbook access and affordability, we also started talking about IP. We also started talking about academic freedom. We also started talking about student academic freedom, which faculty academic freedom, student academic freedom were in different policies. Um, course fees begin to come up. And then all of a sudden, just maybe updating or revising one policy became, becomes an exercise in philosophically thinking through how we're going to uh, improve all of our policies to, to make sure that the goals are, are met that our institutions have because we're co-authoring with them. And then, as I mentioned earlier, making sure that faculty and students know that this work is supportive, that's recognized, and that's empowered. Um, and, and formalizing that can make a, a meaningful difference. And some of the ways that we've seen that is making sure that we are in a position of having stakes in the matter, that we are leading with the implementation, and we're also creating leaders in the process. And that's emerged in not only us setting up faculty fellowships and creating resources and communities of practice among faculty, but also extending opportunities as a convening force at the state level to conduct original research and publication opportunities with, with our academic community. Um, the, the one thing, if there was, if there was one thing, and I think there are many that were missing from the original policy three U, is that there just wasn't a clear understanding of what our stakes were in the board office to make sure that this work was successfully implemented. Next slide. And so TJ and I, we believe that effective policies are effectively social contracts. And so we, we really wanted to try and think about how concisely we could model our general ethos around policy development. And the first is first part of the, the new equation is to look around you and to not discount, um, if you're in a position like ours, the direct and immediate access that you have to really skilled collaborators who are highly educated and also care a lot because naturally this work is going to impact their work. Um, and naturally when policy work impacts an individual's work that they really care about, whether they've been doing it publicly or in isolation, uh, they're, if they care, they're gonna get loud about it. And what we'd seen in the past is that when the academic community gets upset or it's seen that they're getting upset, that they're just being belligerent and they don't wanna change. And, and our experience could have been any more the opposite. Uh, these folks cared and they cared enough to keep coming back as we had sessions to co-develop and, and revise this, this policy. And then importantly, and this was a, a practice for us to educate up with our board, um, really convincing them that good policy should adapt over time and should be malleable and that it should be prone to evolve, that these are living documents. And that's what, part of the power and it's part of the value of having a central board in Idaho. And so, 
the uh, one of the earliest changes that was easy to make was even just reflecting the title of our policy, where the original policy for 3U title was textbook and instructional material affordability. Um, in conversations with our institutions, it really became much more about instructional material access and affordability. And so even there, you can see that the frame broadens a little bit beyond just specifically OER. Next one. And here's a, a snapshot of the new policy in its entirety. It's only about twice the length, but um, just to highlight a few key provisions here. Uh, one thing that we learned early on before we had even talked about revising previous policy 3U is that in work with our provosts, as well as some stakeholders, they really wanted to see a more empirical snapshot of what Idaho could own across all the institutions for what they meant when they said zero cost or very low cost or low cost. And um, it's important to recognize that, you know, because we are working at a regional scale, we're not always gonna get the ideal. Um, and, and so this was an effective means of scaffolding. What, if we do care about cost, what we can do to structure those conversations so that they're more productive instead of just identifying, well, this is a, this is an open class and this is not an open class. Uh, we wanted to have some more information for students. And actually a lot of that, that poll came from student leadership at our institutions wanting to have more information at their time of registration. Um, secondly, we, we build out more of the definitions so that there's some common understanding about terms that we're throwing out there, especially some that were more emergent and new like course marking um, and also automatic charge. And, and again, I'm, I'm grateful for following up on that previous session because automatic charge um, in a policy like this, because we're talking about access and because we're talking about wanting institutions to have a plan about how they're going to ensure that students have access to the materials that they need to be successful, um, it also behooves them to think about the nature of that access and what security concerns exist. So it's not just the automatic billing and the students being able to opt out to meet federal standards, but inevitably what are we giving up and what are our students giving up when we decide to get into um, these third party agreements? And uh, also notably, the, the deliverable this time is not some arbitrary standard about impact at each institution with a specific type of course. It's instead making sure that we have plans in place at every institution. They don't have to be the same plan, but plans that meet their cultural needs to support the work that is outlined um, in, in this policy as it relates to instructional materials. Next. And so uh, to just adapt that earlier graphic, I would, I would put forward that a key difference here now is that instead of a three-part structure where there's the board and the board office versus the institutions, what we really have here is content itself that's living in, in this collaborative space um, that exists between institutions and the board. And ultimately it's our responsibility from now on to make sure that we're shepherding awareness of the policy, of the practice and implementation that exists on the ground level and the need to adapt that policy. Um, it's, it's our responsibility to take that urgency to our board. And it's also our responsibility to make sure that the institutions are well-equipped and well-resourced to handle change. And TJ, I'll let you have the last word if you want it. Thanks. I, I would just say briefly that you know a lot of this. There are a lot of the UNESCO OER recommendation action items that this work fits into the broad work that we we do it in Idaho. But obviously, um, action item two around policy development, but also action item one is institutions develop plans. Uh, I think there's a lot of work toward that first action item happening in in and on the cusp of happening here in Idaho. So it's very exciting to to see that fit within that broader context of the of the recommendation. So thank you for your time and happy to answer questions in the chat as we move along or later. So thank you so much. It was really impressive to listen to, uh, to your work about how you could implement uh, with such, such a success uh, um, the policy uh, on openness and pedagogy and advocacy and leadership um, and the social contract uh, is very important. Uh, and also how you managed to um, move from um, maybe limitations in uh, about awareness and uh, now you really have built in the culture uh, of openness and it's fantastic. I hope there will be some questions um, later on to you. 
Um, so congratulations. <laughs> so the next um, uh, speech is about um, open collaboration toward OER professional development competences. And that is by uh, Matthew, Matthew Bloom, Deborah Baker, and uh, Lisa Jung. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. We're very excited to be here. Um, I'm Matthew Bloom. I am English faculty at Scottsdale Community College, which is in the Phoenix, Arizona area. Um, and I'm also, along with Lisa and Debbie, a tri-chair of Maricopa Community College's um, open education project called Open Maricopa. Um, Lisa, Debbie, do you want to introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Lisa Young. I um, serve as the faculty director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at Scottsdale Community College. And I also serve OE Global as a member of the board. So happy to be here with you all. And I am Debbie Baker. I'm an instructional designer for the Maricopa Center for Learning and Innovation, which is in the district office for the Maricopa Community Colleges. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna share with you our experience, our long journey actually of three years or so, um, developing a set of professional development competencies that were adapted from work that had been done previously. So I think Debbie's gonna start us off by talking about the origin and the, the need for, for this project. So um, in my role in the district office for the, Mar let, me, let me start by talking a little bit about the Maricopa Community Colleges. So we are um, 10 independently accredited community colleges in the Phoenix, Arizona metropolitan area. So we have um, a wide variety of professional development needs across those 10 colleges. And my role um, in the district office is to uh, provide support for professional development for these district-wide initiatives such as um, around Open Maricopa. Um, we were um, in the process of developing a district-wide recognition program or district-wide badging program uh, for these types of initiatives. And so the Open Maricopa project was absolutely one that we wanted to focus on um, developing kind of that, that badging uh, process for. Um, and to get started with that process, we did some quick Google searching and we found an existing set of OER competencies, um, which we'll talk about a little bit in a little bit as well. Um, but, and we had a set of competencies that we were currently using within Open Maricopa, but what we were really looking for was something that would be more widely recognized and so we really wanted to build a framework that would allow our faculty uh, work in OER to be recognized in that, that current state, but also any future work in OER. We wanted that recognition to be flexible and to allow for um, accountability. So what we had at that moment really relied on a handful of people to provide the professional development. And we were looking for competencies that would allow us to open up, no pun intended, the ability for others to provide professional development that aligned back to these very specific set of competencies. So Matthew's gonna talk a little bit about the process. Oh, and I went backwards, there we go. So yeah, I mean, if you take a look at this really excellent timeline here, I have to kind of it's really small on my screen, but um, so <laughs> there we go, it's bigger now. Um, the first thing is, is that the original set of competencies was actually developed from um, a, like a symposium or a, a gathering that, that of which um, OE Global at the time it was the Open Education Consortium was involved in it. It was the organization um, uh, La Francophonie, I think, uh, got together and like developed this set of OER competencies and we discovered it. It was translated into English by the time we got it. Um, and so we looked at it, we found it, you know, it was going to be a really interesting kind of baseline for us maybe to build on and adapt and try to make it work for, for our specific needs. So the first thing we did was we brought it to our OER steering committee, which is um, a representative body across the 10 colleges of Maricopa. We have faculty, administrators, we have um, instructional designers, we have, you know, e-learning directors, things like that. So um, we brought it to, to that group and did some collaborative work sessions over the course of the semester 
where we basically were trying to, you know, get, get feedback, like what is it in, you know, what's missing, what do we like, what would we want to change or reword or try to, you know, again, try to localize it for our needs. Um, we went through that process and then we decided that it would actually be more valuable potentially to those outside of Maricopa uh, if we involved some stakeholders from across the region. And so we used the opportunity in February of 2020, uh, we have had for a few years now, we've had an annual Arizona Regional OER conference and attendees to that conference are not just from across Arizona, but we usually have people from Oklahoma and Nevada, Colorado and other, other states in, the, in kind of the Southwest there. Um, and so what we did, we had a leadership summit on the second day of that conference where it was a pretty small event. I mean, there were maybe, I think there were like 24 people involved, uh, all the major state universities. Uh, you know, we had University of Arizona, Arizona State University and uh, Northern Arizona University all represented along with Maricopa Community Colleges and Yavapai College and Pima Community College. I'm trying to remember who all was there, but off the top of my head, it was a lot of different um, uh, people from different places across the region. And what we did was we actually had, you, there's a picture on the next slide, you'll see it. But what we did was we asked questions, we, we printed out like the competencies as they were. And we asked people to in kind of groups to do kind of the speed dating thing where they go you know, from table to table in a short period of time and like make comments and write the comments down either on the paper or on the whiteboard. Um, and then we captured all of that feedback and then began this long pro I mean, there was the COVID delay, I guess, whatever, but then there was this long process um, that was the, that involved actually some of our steering committee uh, subcommittee members who were helping out to kind of synthesize that feedback uh, because, you know, we had basically at that point, it was a huge mess. I mean, but it was a lot of really, really great ideas about how um, we felt the framework could be improved or at least um, with respect to our needs. And so what we did eventually compile uh, all that feedback, synthesize it into a draft set of competencies that we then iterated through the steering committee one last time to get kind of overall feedback. And then we took the opportunity in February, just this last February at our regional conference to basically have a couple of public forums where we were um, giving people the opportunity to kind of look through those things and have some discussions. And so from that, we collected yet another round of feedback um, and I'm happy to say that finally, there is a draft 2.0 version of it that, that we've published and that we are happy to share with you all today. And these are the pictures like I was talking, I mean, this is the kind of thing, there were like, I don't know, eight or nine of these pictures plus comments on documents and Google Docs and also it was a really messy feedback process, but it's kind of always like that. Um, so it was kind of a lot of fun, also challenging and kind of painstaking to go through and like sift out all of the little nuggets there that, and also trying to work out contradictions because sometimes we would have people saying opposite things. And so it, it would be very, it was interesting to bring those discussions, kind of elevate them um, and, and bring those questions back to the steering committee and then, and kind of have those. And, and eventually, you know, over the course of this, you know, almost three year process, most of the questions we felt got worked out um, but one of the things that we are um, hoping to do with you here today is, is, you know, ask you, and we'll get to this in a minute here, but kind of ask you what, how you might be able to use this, but also if you have feedback about things that you think we're missing and stuff like that, then we would love to hear about it so that we could further improve it. So the competencies um, that we ended up with are developed across six different groups of um, information with two to three categories per group and two to six competencies per category. So we ended up with, if I did my math correctly, 57 total competencies. So group A is very is all about becoming familiar with OER. And then you see the these are the categories here, which I'm not going to read to you, but just kind of broadly, this group A is really about um, just developing a basic understanding of OER. Group B is all about searching for and evaluating OER. Um, so this the cat the categories here really um, hone in on. Um, finding appropriate OER as well as and being able to use those search tools. 
Group C is all about using OER legally and ethically. Um, and so each of these two, while well, there's two categories here, there are several competencies behind each category and we'll get to the document in just a second. Group D is all about creating and adapting OER. And group E is about sharing OER. And really groups A through E, a lot of that information, we were able to really start from the original set of competencies that we had found. Um, but then we got to group F and we, this was an addition we felt about applying open to pedagogy and really digging into providing some competencies around open pedagogy. So, I'm going to share the, I'm going to open up the document itself and we'll provide the link to the slides and the link to the competencies in the chat in just a second. But these are the competencies themselves. And Matthew, did you want to kind of walk through the document? I'm going to make well, it. Well, I don't want to, I certainly don't want to read the document to everybody, but what I, what I was interested in, in adding, um, you noted that the first five categories were, are very similar and the, 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 the ultimately the competencies competencies themselves have been considerably rewritten from the original uh, framework that we discovered, which was openly licensed, by the way. I mean, it was it was an open education you know, initiative but um, or project. But uh, so so the individual competencies competencies are, are considerably different now, but the, the grouping was was pretty much the same. Two things that we did, Debbie mentioned, we did expand it by one category to really try to involve open pedagogy and the idea of renewable assignments and, and um, you know, the kinds of things that, the benefits that are associated with that and practices. Um, but one of the other things that we did throughout as well was we tried to put more, um, we tried to kind of expand the, the contextualization of open education. Um, so that it was, because it was very practical, the, the framework at the beginning was very practical and, and, and that was actually a very good thing, but we wanted to kind of weave in some of the philosophy behind open education and some of the other, um, you know, kind of related pedagogies and theoretical approaches that aren't necessarily um, like, that, that are in, that influence open, uh, open education in some way or another. So you can see in here, um, you know, global factors that emerge. It's not just about, you know, pre-culture and creative commons, but there's also this potential relationship that we see through uh, with open education uh, connected to critical pedagogy, black feminist pedagogy, social justice theory, that kind of stuff. So trying to, you know, expand the picture here and, and, and just see how, get faculty and anyone else using this through the workshops that we're gonna present you know, this gives us the framework that we're going to need to um, really try to ensure that anyone that we're giving that certification to, you know, the badging um, or any of the workshops that we that we offer are actually serving a purpose according to, you know, the, um, the framework that we've developed. That's pretty much it. I mean, like, I think that the slides did a really good job. Um, this is this document is um, anyone can comment on this document. So I definitely encourage if you're interested um, you can also, it's openly licensed, so if you just want to take it and make your own adaptations or whatever, then that's fine too. But if you want to comment on the document, we would love um, to hear your thoughts. And so one of the things that we'd like to do is we would like to get your feedback on um, the professional competencies that we've shared. We, we gave a very broad overview and you see the document that you'll be able to explore, but we wanted to gather some of your feedback live today um, on what are some ways you might use these professional competencies at your institution or in your situation. And so we're using a tool called Mentimeter and um, you can either open a browser on your phone or another browser on your computer, and you go to www.menti, that's M E N T I dot com, and you use the code 4291 4322. And I'll repeat that several times for you. Um, you go to www.menti, that's M E N. TI.com and the code is 4291-4322.
And we did put that code in the chat, but I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you one more time. I see people are already responding. The code is 4291-4322. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so I can show you the results that are coming in. So um, we're, we're, get, we're getting a few response, responses. Again, that's menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com. And the code is 4291-4322. And um, someone mentioned that they could use it for assessing the open ed competencies of all of their educators. Um, use it in training with OER, with your librarians, your instructional designers, but also when introducing people to the concept of OER, we're seeing um, sending the framework to their colleagues that know I run Ontario Extend Professional Development Program, fantastic. Um, looking at hiring OER support staff, they could be part of a job description. I love that idea. We're going to give you a few more minutes to um, give us some responses because, um, you know, as, as these competencies are developed, we really wanted to use it for the professional development. But I really like that idea of um, identifying the job description. That's fantastic. Um, expanding, ex expanding awareness for open pedagogy. And Lisa, can I add just a, with respect to the um, training, training others and helping with OER, um, there was actually somebody who joined us at the forum this last year um, who was like super excited that we were, you know, that he, he was being part, that he was part of it, but that, you know, that we were doing this because he actually said, you know, I wish that this had been available two years ago when we started our, our open education in, initiative at the university, because um, it was one of those kinds of things where if for us, maybe America of Millions has been around for so long and, and, and we already had these competencies and we kind of like, had some organization, but for an organization that's just starting an initiative, right? It can be very helpful to kind of get a sense of like, well, what are all the potential complexities? What are all the, the things that need to be teased out as you're, as you're moving forward? So I think that that um, in terms of, you know, the training aspect is really good too. Definitely, definitely. And um, we're seeing a few more um, responses, assessing where people are in OER knowledge for training and for ad advocacy, um, as well as formalizing the disciplinary foundations of open education in evaluating the scholarly work of faculty. And that could even be used towards tenure and things like that. Absolutely loving it. Thank you so much for those of you who have um, responded. We have one more open-ended question for you. And that is, What's missing? So we shared, and I know that we shared them fairly quickly, but from what you've heard or seen in these competencies, do you think there's anything missing? Um, or were you like, oh, wow, they didn't cover this. Um, we'd love to get that feedback. And we do understand, like Lisa said, that you're, you haven't been able to you know, read through the entire thing at this point. So, yes. we, you know, just in general, maybe like uh, based on our descriptions, I guess that might be the best response. Definitely, yeah, thanks Matthew. It's been through a number of iterations, so um, we, we think it's pretty comprehensive, but we just value um, the OE global community. And if you see anything missing, we'd love to include it. Um, I also was really um, happy like that we included the UNESCO sustainability goals and such. I think that um, that was a great piece for us to include in our competencies. We were, I was really pleased to see that when we were developing them. And as we're waiting for responses to come in, I, I would also add that I can speak personally to this, uh, that like the process of going through this whole thing, you know, revealed to me where the gaps in my understanding were, you know, like where, 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 where is it that I'm like, you know, do I have blind spots? Is there something that I'm completely, you know, ignoring that I shouldn't be ignoring when, when, because I did a lot of professional development, um, like I ran a lot of professional development workshops for Maricopa. I've done that for years now. And, um, and so this really put me through a growth process as well. And I think that that was uh, very meaningful. But well, we're not getting any feedback on that. And that's totally fine. We did cover those quite quickly. And um, but we, we appreciate um, all of your involvement in our presentation and hope that you can use these resources at your institutions.
Yeah, absolutely. Feel free to use OEG Connect. Also, like I said, that document is you can make comments right in that Google Doc. So that would also be um, that's kind of ideal because I mean, as great as OEG Connect is for 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 having ongoing discussions, um, at least if we capture it in the document, then it's something that we'll be able to you know address at some point. And I think that's just about it. Thank you all so yes. much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this inspiration. I think uh, follow the chat. There is a lot of uh, discussions going on there as well. So I think it was really inspiring. And as you were saying, it is important to build um, the culture, the pedagogy within uh, these competences. Uh, so it is um, per default. And as you were saying now in the end as well, it is while you're going to this process, it's also some kind of a self-evaluation and benchmarking uh, process. So I'm sure there will uh, be more questions. And as I said, there's a lot of discussions going on on all the sessions, I will say. So it's really uh, very interesting. So thank you very much for that. So we are moving to um, the last uh, presentation in this uh, session, and that is by uh, Philip uh, Anaya providing equity to universal access. So the floor is yours. And please thank continue the great conversation in the chat as well. <laughs> yes, thank you. I know it's getting uh, close to midnight where you're at, right? So good <laughs> evening. Uh, good afternoon. I'm in Texas uh, in the United States. And uh, good morning to those of y'all over in the Far East. Um, First time presenting for uh, OE Global, and uh, thank you for the privilege and uh, your attention. And uh, if we go to the next slide, I want to go ahead and start and jump in. Uh, I'll probably start by stating we're going to follow along uh, the lines of uh, JT and Jim's presentation with the overall state and regional policy and jump into what it looks like at, at an institution. Uh, I'm again, I'm in San Antonio, Texas, in the United States, uh, and I am. Uh, at the district level of a organization that is comprised of five independently accredited institutions similar to Maricopa um, that has its own unique challenges. Um, but I've been lucky enough to be part of this institution that has a very forward thinking board and uh, vision. And I've named a couple of policies here that, that, we, that we've taken to, to heart. And the first one is the Alamo way, which is our mantra, which is always inspire, always improve. Uh, and it's something that I've uh, taken in my six years at Alamo working with this, this program. I am the Digital Know Your Coordinator for the district and work with all five colleges. And it's something that gives you the right to be that squeaky wheel, uh, which you sometimes need to be in these, in these programs, no matter where you are, if it's well-established or new, um, we're here for the success of our students. And that bottom line there is actually from our policy as well as the success of Alamo Colleges will be measured by the success of the students. Um, I welcome you all to take that and steal it if you'd like. You can substitute any name in there, uh, institution you'd like. Uh, but it speaks volumes to, to the vision and, and the, the practice of Alamo Colleges and the work of its faculty. Next slide. I, I don't need to preach the choir, but students are not buying their materials. And it's still prevalent. This is a pre-pandemic 2018-2019 um, National Survey by Vital Source um, that highlights the issues students face. Um, I'm not going to read them to you, but you can see it's a large percentage are not buying their materials. Uh, for Alamo, next slide. We took that and actually took this course survey uh, for spring of uh, 20, just when the pandemic was hitting, and we sent out just under 140,000, got back 6,000. That's a duplicated count. It's course count versus actual students wanting to try and get them as many times as we could. Uh, so the 6,100 is closer to 10% of our FTE uh, respond, responded to these questions. And the two I'm gonna highlight, next slide please, actually reflect the same questions we showed. Over half were not buying all of the required materials because of cost. And that's in San Antonio, in our colleges, um, pre-pandemic nearly 40% uh, of them stated that that decision impacted their performance or weren't sure. So, you know, going back to our board policy, 
it was something that spoke volumes. Um, it wasn't one thing we did. It was a number of things I want to go over and show you in the next, next slide, outlining our timeline here. And our goal was to make our students goal attainable that I'm pretty sure if we were to send this out over the last decade, the numbers would probably be the same. And I'm pretty sure now it'd be a little higher just because of the post pandemic uh, wave we're having um, for our students locally. Um, but it's still an issue. So I'm gonna highlight our, our journey uh, that we've had over the last decade. Uh, I've been at the Reigns for over six years here at Alamo, um, but it, it wasn't one thing we did. It's a number of things we did and are continuing to doing uh, and looking to do in the future to make our students goal obtainable. Next slide, please. Uh, before I get into phase one, our exploratory phase, I wanna start by stating this journey is not mine. I am a one man shop at Alamo Colleges, uh, but this is truly collaborative effort. Um, uh, it, it's not one faculty, staff, librarian, uh, administrator that's assigned to be a coordinator or director of OER at an institution. It's a truly collaborative effort. It's the work of the faculty. Um, it's the work from student success, our finance department, our information technology, uh, and our uh, academic success that truly build this program. Uh, and it's one of the few programs across higher ed that it's truly community effort to get off the ground and make it truly successful. So I want to stress that. Uh, but nearly 10 years um, ago, faculty and students presented to the Board of Trustees their concern about the cost of materials. And I believe a faculty member actually presented after attending a conference, introducing OER back in 2012. The board took steps to help with this and actually created guidelines to help with this cost uh, struggle with the publishers constantly creating custom editions. And we know all the stories that go along with that. Uh, but they started there with implementing some policies for instructional material guidelines to help with selection of materials to help with that cost. You had some adoption guidelines that you're going to keep it for three years and so forth that started following that in 2014 we had a formal introduction of oer by palo alto college to our board after attending one of the, the uh, conferences that was held um, regionally and that fostered a pilot at that college with several humanity courses following that with an inclusive access pilot in our math courses from san antonio college and uh, st phillips college we truly got the wheels turning with the board of trustees looking at this at with serious lenses and actually implementing a chancellor's charge to formally look at this and actually report out of what's going on nationally regionally and within our colleges at that time we created a task force and actually revised the instruction material guidelines to actually formalize oer as a qualifying adoption for courses and then we started collaborating nationally and regionally with becoming a member of the CCC OER community. Uh, we we're part of the Achieve a Dream OER grant and also um, participated in the OpenStax Institutional Partnership, which is hugely beneficial. Next slide. <clears throat> Following the success of those, those two programs, the, the Achieving a Dream and the uh, OpenStax, uh, we realized that we needed heavy faculty development, uh, both with our administrators and our faculty, as well with our student development to help them understand what this was. Um, we were kind of modeling ourselves after California with a true no cost initiative for our um, open educational uh, movement. We named it Alamo Open. Um, we separated these two because there was a strong OER for cost movement happening in the United States, uh, which was an inclusive access program, but was focused on OER materials. So we created a separate entity with IM Direct, which is our inclusive access initiative where we negotiated and had uh, per course fees, not a flat fee across. So we negotiated the lowest price and that's what we, we charged uh, students into a course fee. Um, both were searchable. That was part of state policy that came down. Um, both echo day one availability and access for students. Um, and both have been highly successful. I'll get that to uh, shortly. Next slide, please. With phase two, 
with both programs rolling fairly, fairly strongly, we brought in an outside consultant to do an independent system-wide analysis across what we were doing. Uh, we tend to get bogged down with, with uh, foggy lenses, so to speak, with, with our work um, when we're working so closely to, with it. Uh, we felt the independent uh, consultant could give us a better sense of where we are compared nationally and regionally, and also identify our best practices and what we could improve on, um, <clears throat> as well as uh, conducted independent stakeholder interviews uh, individually with, with key stakeholders and then collectively with faculty across all five colleges. That consultant actually brought back reports um, and actually sparked a few key movements with, within our, our organization. One was um, the Alamo colleges had a strategic planning retreat and this was outlined as one of the big three ideas for funding pre and during the pandemic. Um, it also spawned the creation of the Universal Access Work Group which is kind of where we're led, led, led us to where we are now in developing strategies to expand both programs under one, um, under one universal access. Next slide, please. This group that um, led to this phase three was actually comprised of faculty and librarians was charged with developing universal access program implementation timeline, identifying universal access program comp uh, components and strategies developing an implementation process and supporting the campuses and colleges implementation of these strategies. <laughs> the work of the work group um, has spawned a proof of concept and is looking to go to scale for this next year, um, fall 22. Um, and our goal is to actually implement this with all students in some capacity. Um, I know in the chat, you, you all have uh, heard about House Bill 1027, it was the transparency law that was signed in um, to state law in Texas uh, this past legislative session. It's basically outlining the, the uh, inclusive access programs with fee-based programs and how that can better be transparent for students. Uh, we're trying to build a program that is within that those guidelines to truly impact the students of the Alamo colleges and be ready day one. Next slide, please. Uh, before I get into the success of our programs and where we're headed, I want to go over our, our methodology because this is something that, that is, um, varies across institutions uh, within the state and within the United States. Um, but we, we follow the Department of Education's um, pricing on how much a course material cost. Uh, this was adopted by OpenStax. Uh, pre-2016 and was modified in 2018. So according to the Center for Educational Statistics, in May of 2018, the average cost of undergrad spent on instructional materials was $555.60. Uh, Dividing that over the average number of courses of seven, the number we come up with is 79.37. We use that number from May, from basically fall 2018, to now, previously that number was actually um, 98.57 with the same calculations. Um, on the other side, our weighted average savings is $55 with our inclusive access program. Uh, we went with a weighted average based off of our majority of courseware offerings uh, that was offered with our math and sciences that widely use the IM Direct or inclusive access programs. Um, and it kind of threw off our average when the courseware and, and all the manuals that went with it were saving students hundreds of dollars. Um, the weighted average kind of balanced out fairly well, taking into consideration our Spanish program, which was typically 150, was now right at 40 bucks. So uh, the weighted average worked out well as we calculate that savings across the board um, for the next slide. Course offerings um, at the Alamo Colleges. Again, this is starting from 2014 to now with a fall to fall comparison. Here you can see the growth as, as we've moved forward um, from having one course in our that was actually searchable by students in our in our um, syllabi, one course of OER to where we're offering over 2,500 courses, course sections in fall of 20. 
that number is a little higher now. We're still calculating fall 21, uh, but you can see that growth rate as we've moved across. Next slide, please. As we look at duplicated headcount, we can see that one course is at 24 students to now we're, we're just over 55,000 students impacted um, by these two programs. Again, this is duplicated because they can take more than one course um, and shows the, the growth and impact that we've had on our students. Our next slide will show actual cost savings from fall to fall. And you can see in, in fall of 20, we saved an estimated $3.3 million, three, close to 3.4 um, in fall 20 alone. That's, that's where we're at. We're hoping our goal is to actually maintain our, our blue there at the bottom. You can see that we're just on the edge of, of breaking 1 million saved in true no cost savings utilizing the Department of Education numbers we mentioned earlier. Um, we can see right now the, the growth is, is steady. Moving to the next slide, you can see a total impact of course offerings. Um, these are course sections offered from 2014 to now, it's just over 20,000. And our next slide will show you our estimated total impact from, from spring of 2014 to, to actually, this is actually to spring 2021 uh, um, of just over $28 million estimated savings to students. Our goal moving forward is to actually impact all of our students here in a hybrid of both of these. We feel it is important that we both focus on our OER initiative and grow that. Um, next slide, please, Liz. Um, and actually work both because we do, we still have faculty that utilize the fee-based OER programs. We have great relationships with certain publishers that we that we use to build. Um, but our OER is, is truly impactful because it's zero cost um, and is the model we wanna focus on as we move into our inclusive access, um, sorry, wrong choice of words, our universal access model uh, that has all the students' books ready for day one. We're saving the students time, money, and frustration as, as many of them resort to several ways to obtain their books. And they're prepared for class and they have a higher sense of success and, and completion um, as, as evident with, with our OER program and, and several our inclusive access courses. Um, I look forward to coming back next year to, to show the success and what we've come up with, with this universal access model um, and open the floor to any questions. Thank you for having me. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. It was uh, very much to think about uh, for universal access. Thanks a lot. Um, so um, we have um, come to the end of this um, of the, uh, all the presentations. So we started off with um, Rory McWheel with the blockchain and OER, and um, his argument was about that the blockchain is good for OER and OER is good for blockchain. Uh, then we had a tell on this team about surveillance, capitalism, and open education, and large-scale data from Latin America. And uh, your argument was mainly about um, we need to focus on technology and the openness of technology and uh, how we deal with that. Um, and the open education um, dimensions and uh, for OER. Uh, then we had um, Bliss, uh, T.G. Bliss and Jonathan Lashley about Look Around You and the very successful model you have implemented uh, for uh, open education policy um, at your institutions. And then we had um, Matthew and Deborah and Lisa who <clears throat> talked us too about the open collaboration towards uh, OER professional development competences. And there was a very lively discussion about that in the chat. And then now finally, uh, we had um, uh, Philip about providing equity uh, to universal access. Uh, for me, I think it is for you as well. It has really been 
more than overwhelming, <laughs> I would say. So thank you all so very much for your insights and sharing so freely your experiences and what you have, what you are working with, and where you are. Um, it is really a lot. It is really, really a lot, and it's really, really impressive. Uh, I have seen in the chat that um, there's a lot of networking going on already, and people have starting to come together, and they will continue to work together and learn from each other at, at different levels, not at least about how to implement um, um, the model for developing of open education policy. Uh, always uh, agreements, I will say. <laughs> and also about how to deal with uh, the professional development of, of um, competences and the model um, you showed us, with Matthew and uh, Deborah and Lisa. So um, with that, I will see if I have some questions. There were first a lot of questions to you, Rory, about, uh, about um, the blockchain and OER. And also, are, are there any good, because I think that was maybe some kind of um, new dimensions for many of us, uh, how we can look at that. And there were questions about, um, are there any good examples um, how this is uh, coming to reality? Well, at, at present with OER, no, the main, um, the main implementations now have to do with certification, uh, using them with uh, micro credentials and uh, uh, alternate uh, credentialing forms. And that seems to be the way things are going. But it occurred to me that uh, OER should and could and should play a significant role in the development of uh, of blockchain in education and uh, vice versa. I thought that uh, OER could uh, benefit from blockchain, uh, but do, do I know this? No, um, I, I think I'm just putting, putting the idea forward and we'll have to investigate it further to see uh, uh, what exactly uh, the benefits and problems are. And there was some questions about the costs, uh, who are going to pay for it? And uh, the cost, from, from the certification uh, point of view, if you're using blockchain for certification, um, there seems to be some major cost savings possible by getting out of that whole, uh, um, the bureaucracy uh, of it. So there it is, if, if they can um, uh, overcome the problems with the high cost of uh, uh, electricity with using them, and there are some uh, promising developments on that. Um, from using them with OER, I think uh, uh, we'll have to have a look, start doing it and see see what happens uh, as far as the cost. I'm, I'm not 100% convinced by any means, uh, uh, but I, I think it's definitely worth looking into. Um, there was a question, I think, about, um, I think it was from Colin about sustainability and uh, how to develop uh, um, technology to in a in a greener way uh, through blockchain. I share that I share that concern because uh, the way blockchain is configured with uh, um, uh, POW, it's very it, it is a huge eater of energy, and we have to find other ways. And there are some promising new uh, developments that lower that. Uh, uh, exponentially those costs so i'm optimistic about that but it certainly is a reason for concern excuse me <coughs> okay. so, um, i know there are a lot of more questions in in the chat but i will stop here and i will come back to to each of you later on on um, some common questions but i will move to you tell um about um, so, so thank you very much, Rory. So far, um, so for you, tell. Um, I think there were questions about how to. Um, let me see my notes. I mean, you 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 um, talked us too about uh, the importance of looking at the technology side as well, and the openness, and uh, what we really are working with, and the, um, 
also about the costs about that and also about the value propositions about different kind of technologies. So um, how can how can we build on your argumentation to move this um, your argument further on, so to say? <laughs> I think that was more or less like the questions from the audience. Sure. Um... I think that that's uh, you, you focused on three main main uh, issues about reducing choices and platforms and um, privacy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that one of the one of the big concerns that people have is is this seems like uh, an insurmountable uh, uh, problem, right? There's there's nothing we can do about it. One of the things that we've uh, we've emphasized is there are a lot of things that teachers can do at the level of dealing with others, you know, with their own students in, in terms of what platforms and what systems they adopt. Uh, so creating a group on, on, a, on a for a chat where you use something like a, 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 a WhatsApp, you can have find, you know, a dozen other alternatives where that can happen. Using a video conference system that's not proprietary and commercial is very easy to do. So there are very small things that teachers can do generally to do this, but also we're working with administrators to get them aware of these problems. And you know, we, we're able to get people to understand that this is a problem, especially now that what happened, uh, what was expected to happen. So you know, Google, for example, offered free services to a very large degree that were unlimited. And now suddenly they're charging the universities and these universities moved terabytes and petabytes of data to their servers. And now they, they have nothing that they can do you know, they're stuck with Google and they have to pay for the service. And that was very predictable. Uh, and that's going to change now where people are going to see that the other alternatives and other ways have to, to coexist with this because we're going to be slaves to these, these, these uh, platforms if we don't find all their alternatives. And there are countries yeah. that are doing this uh, well. So I think we have places to look at. And do you have any examples of countries? Sorry, can you say that again? Um, did, do you have any examples of countries doing that or this already? Yeah, so sure. One, of course, I, I'll mention Brazil is, you know, we have yeah. a very large uh, consortium of, of universities um, through the, it's called ENIP, the National Research Institute that has yeah. its own video conferencing system that's nationwide. Um, yeah. uh, you can look at Henater in France, for example, as an example, you could look at SurfNL in Netherlands as where they offer, you know, in different modes, they offer services that are based on free and open source software at a consortium based level, which I think are really interesting to explore. And there are different models out there um, that can, can easily as a consortium, you know, higher institutions or government can offer alternatives. And we could put these, these other platforms in the correct place, which is a commercial platform they can adopt in certain scenarios, but not where they become hegemonic and take over our, our technological systems. Uh, thank you. And then um, we had a look around you by um, TG and Jonathan and um, the discussion were really uh, lively here. <laughs> and you more or less uh, for, uh, formed a consortium about how to move further on and how to learn from, from and by and to each other. Um, you presented to us the very successful model you had uh, developed um, to collaboration, to awareness raising with, with sustainability um, for uh, uh, open education policy at, uh, at the regional level and, and the model you have described, uh, built mainly on um, openness, pedagogy, um, advocacy and leadership and with a social contract, which uh, was really interesting. Um, uh, there were a lot of questions, but I think you, you more or less solved them in between you and how you could collaborate and how to learn by and to and from each other. Uh, so um, I will leave that by now. And then we had the um, uh, presentation by Matthew and Deborah and uh, Lisa about the professional development competences and um, uh, what you focused on it was very much about not just to talk about uh, i mean the um, oer as such but also to build in um, um, the pedagogy uh, aspects and uh, uh, about eth ethical aspects and uh, also what is um, and how, how, how the process is going on and how you can learn from each other to that and also doing doing that and going through the process, you can also see the, the missing points. And I appreciated that you 
uh, also took the opportunity to learn from the audience here what uh, what they were thinking about it, and I hope it was um, a benef benefit in your your further work and also the the audience, of course. <coughs> Um, and then we had um, finally um, Philip or about uh, universal access, and uh, you showed us a very interesting uh, presentation about how about cost saving and also about enrollment and uh, uh, really uh, a lot of facts and figures um, how you can move further on with the uh, universal access. Um, I know I have missed. Uh, for sure, many of the questions in the chat. The chat will be saved, and it will be. I think it will be uploaded to together with this session, because there's also a lot of interesting links and all the discussions you have uh, have had in the networking you have done throughout the the the, the session. Um, but finally, um, I would like to ask each of you um, to present it. I mean, each of the groups present it. As this um, uh, session um, was is about uh, building capacity and developing supportive policy, um, so how can we move further on and learning from what you have presented and discussed with us uh, tonight? I'm saying tonight because it is, uh, from my perspective, <laughs> maybe in the morning for you. But uh, what we, what we have been discussing for the last couple of hours, um, how how can we, from your perspective, what you have presented to us? Uh, develop support, develop um, and also monitoring, uh, because that is also a, a, an issue for the OER recommendation, monitoring and, and evaluation. <coughs> um, develop develop uh, supportive policies um, within the areas you have, have um, discussed and presented for us. And how can we, by that, uh, learn from each other to move forward um, and to, to, how to say, to have those good examples and to scale it up in other parts of the world, in other institutions, in other regions. So maybe I start from the, the last presenter now, so you will not start always, uh, Rory. So I would start with you, Philip. <laughs> um, I, I know I, I was talking offline with uh, one of the presenters. I, I'd probably start with policy to, to build on faculty and throw in staff development and meet faculty where they are. I think the Maricopa presentation um, was impactful because it's showing that the workers going into those competencies. Um, for Alamo, we're, we're in the middle, still still in the whiteboard phase of building uh, tracks that are scaffolded to meet faculty where they are because I like most institutions, our faculty have the 10% that are early adopters that are well-versed in OER, um, maybe may be creating some and then we have 80% that could could go either way. Yeah. So trying to trying to build policy and programs, whether it be incentivized and or count towards tenure, whatever it is at your institution, to build policy around that growth and, and advocacy to meet them where they are would be very impactful. I think that is very, very true because it is, I mean, it is uh, of course nice to have those overall uh, policies or strategies or whatever, but you, it's really, really true. You, you have to, to get people with you, you need to meet them where they are and the, in their context and their, uh, with their language and with their uh, culture, et cetera, because uh, uh, change is made by people, not by policies. Well stated, yes. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, so um, uh, Matthew and Deborah and Lisa, from your perspective. So I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, I would say that for us, these uh, professional competencies were a really important first step it, for us in furthering the conversation about OER with the faculty um, and, and even you know, staff and administration that aren't as familiar with OER, right? We, we've got those early adopters on board and really excited. And now we really need to be able to communicate to others kind of what else there is and what they can do um, and still recognize all the amazing work that those early adopters have done within Maricopa. So like that, that's really where we're at. I think you're also saying that you have to meet the, the staff and the people where they are. And not Absolutely. Just 
Yeah. Absolutely. We need to educate uh, folks as well, right? Okay. Thank you. That, oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just sorry. I would add to that. It was. It's also valuable for us to. We we tried to do two things at the same time, which was which was adapt the the competencies to meet our specific needs, but then also create something that would be valuable for those outside of our institution. So yeah. Um, and and part of the reason for that is um, that at least across Arizona, we do have kind of an emerging network of institutions who are um, kind of informally collaborating on OER work uh, just through the regional conference and things like that. And so we figured that it would be good to have a framework that we could potentially all use so that we could align some of our initiatives, you know, according to kind of a set of standards that we thought were, were most appropriate. Yeah, so I think that is also very true. I mean, of course, you need to um, to start with the people you have around you, but it's also good if you can maybe scale up it as you were sharing with us today, for example, that we can use this model if, if we like, we can adapt it and we can share it and we can work further on it. Um, so that is also very important to sometimes see outside your institution as well. But I would also just add that I think that one of the um, capacity building pieces of this also is that we didn't start this. This was started in France. Um, and I think that the international efforts that we can all work together to do really meaningful work is yeah. really important for us not to, to lose. Yeah, that, that's important. Thank you. Um, I will continue, but I will just say um, uh, thanks to you who are, I see that some people are leaving because it's this different kind of uh, appointments and dinners or whatever. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for, you, for those of you who have, uh, have to leave, um, but we will continue uh, for a while. Uh, so um, uh, let me see, uh, then we come to, um, to uh, TG and Jonathan, I think. Um, the same question for you, how can we um, build further on your work uh, for other institutions, for other regions, for other countries when it comes to implement policies? I think, uh, however, <laughs> this discussion has been ongoing in the, in the chat that you already have um, started to, to have plans how to do, but maybe we can have some words from you as well. Uh, sure, Jonathan, are you? joining on here you come uh you know my you know my first thought well we, we've shared we can start by sharing those resources right uh and then jonathan and i are thinking about potentially writing something up that can describe the process in a little more detail but i mean every context is different i think that the general model reframing policy as a social contract uh thinking about implementation not just you know getting a policy and you know that's hard i mean i was involved in in the OER, the UNESCO OER recommendation from, from some of the initial conversations. And it's it, it seems like a huge thing to get something like that on the books. It's much bigger to implement it as we are all you know, experiencing. And this conference is designed around that. So the more that we can think about implementation from the beginning and, and including stakeholders, those who are impacted in that policy development as much as possible, the better off uh, we're going to be in the long run because otherwise it's just it's just an edict. No matter what policy it is, no matter how good it is, there it's just words. If people aren't bought into it, if they don't understand it, if they don't feel like it's part, if they don't feel like they've signed the social contract as well. Now there'll be a number of people who will abide, but you're not gonna you're not gonna have people who are willing participants uh, if they if they don't feel like they're part of that that contract. I really, I really can't more than agree with you because I mean, to have a policy is not a goal as such, uh, absolutely not, but uh, your way, building awareness, uh, working together and having, working with this uh, social, social contract and building sustainability within the, your process as well, it's very, very important because it is very much about um, um, culture uh, creation and culture curation. Um, and and again, um, changes are not made by policies. It's made by people, and people need to be involved and to have the ownership and power empowerment. So to encourage people, I think you have shown very, very, very good examples how how you could manage to to build empowerment and to engage people yeah, within your model. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, I'll just 
add um, briefly that, and I think this has a lot to do with change management and just sort of how things aligned for us successfully, where both TJ and I were coming into new roles with um, relative political capital to expend. And I don't think any of us like upsetting people um, or like making time for people who are upset. But it's so critical to this work. Again, as I mentioned in the slides, people who are upset, they care about something. And if you can get to the bottom of what they care about, they can also be your fiercest allies in, in your collective work. And I think so often policy development before TJ and I came into our board office, it was mired in individuals' issues with the process and at what point they were included, at what point they were excluded. And there was uh, this, this legacy um, that, that ultimately pitted three different groups against each other. It was board staff versus our board versus those people on campus that were impacted by board policy. And being able to, you know, it's, it's cheeky, but being able to take a break, pause, look around you and assess that this may not have worked in the past, but also what were the differences in those factors? Who was, who was consulted? When were they consulted? How were they consulted? And specifically on a topic like uh, open education, awareness is perpetually growing. And so recognizing that even if we had a stale conversation with someone around open education six months ago, restarting that conversation now is going to be different and it might yield different outcomes. And so just being willing to take that risk and make time and listen to people, um, it's, it's, been, it's been really key because it actually had to exist on the board level as well. And that we had board members that we had to recalibrate their expectations and, and basically convince them that OER wasn't a silver bullet, that everything they had been led to believe that it was going to change education in all these meaningful ways, that at scale, there were already far superior models on ground at our campuses. That was our burden. And it was really helpful to see when the board did pass this policy um, earlier this year, that some of the members who were most supportive of OER um, out of a cost framing perspective, being from a business community, they were, one of them was actually cycling off our board and he was thrilled to see where the policy had gone and how much additional value we were able to put into it by consulting those on the ground stakeholders. Yes, I think you had on your timeline uh, one, one part to listen to people. Um, but um, I suppose you had some people who maybe were maybe not the gays, but uh, not, maybe not uh, so much uh, positive or some, um, you know, there's always people who are difficult, <laughs> so to say. So, so how do you do you deal with that? We, and, and it might just be part of the special makeup of Idaho's education community. Uh, we have a coalition of, of willing contributors and collaborators that it's not fully representative. It's not every faculty member or every instructional technologist or instructional designer or librarian, but those that are interested, we have common affinities and common goals. And we recognize that there's multiple, multiple pathways to reaching those outcomes. And I think the best way to win over some of the skeptics is to get the work done and yield some results. You know, I, another thing that J Jonathan has taught me this, uh, you know, as we face the occasional, usually faculty member who is aggravated or, you know, uh, may, maybe complaining about something or um, being difficult, if you will, in rhetoric. Um, Jonathan and I agree, we, we'll take that faculty member over the unengaged any day because we trust that, that, that their aggravation or negative feelings come from a, a place of deep uh, love for what they do in education that they're, they're, they're not complaining because they want to complain they're, they're, they're expressing their opinion because they care. So we start with that uh, and recognize their motivation and say, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll listen and hear that because that's you, you care. If you care, then your opinion really matters if you're willing to, to share it. And obviously we try to elicit opinions from those who are unengaged, but that's much harder than, than the faculty who's, who's yelling at you. Yeah, to, to emphasize TJ's point, um, I was a faculty member who liked to complain a lot. And so I have to believe that, that people had the same motives I do. But again, uh, listen to people because, I mean, um, uh, for one another reason, people think or say what, I mean, there is a re always a reason behind it. And um, 
when you discuss with people and when you really listen to them, it's easier to understand at least. And uh, so thank you very much. Sorry, really quickly, just yeah. a, a constant refrain that we got from listening to faculty was just how offended they were from the original policy. Because again, it dismissed their really thoughtful efforts to improve access and opportunity for their students around course materials as inferior, as, as not desirable, as, as not ideal. And again, hearing that it was our responsibility to, to show that it was in many cases more impactful and more sustainable. Uh, thank you so much. I think um, we have, um, Tell has left, I think. He wrote that in the chat. Um, is it right you're not here, Tell, uh, any longer? Okay. So um, uh, last, uh, Rory, I have the same question for you. How to implement uh, your arguments into policies and again maybe not just to policies as a document but as um, we have heard from um, from TJ and Jonathan how to to get the implementation and uh, to get the things default and to get people with you within this policy well I fully agree that uh, awareness is key and getting the support from uh, faculty and uh, in my uh, experience and uh, from what I believe the experience of most of us in the movement is your best move is to go with the people who want to go. And that's how you build a movement is you create the awareness, the aware people, some of them will uh, be gung ho for OER and some won't go with the people who are enthusiastic and just do it. And yeah. as far as policy is concerned and Maybe some uh, uh, of the Canadian participants uh, may disagree with me, but in Canada, we don't have any policies uh, and uh, we Im we've implemented quite a bit around the country. There's yeah. an incredible amount of activity and real world implementations of OER uh, going on and I don't see any policies. And so I don't think that uh, uh, either one is needed. In, uh, in fact, some people, uh, uh, the idea is you create a policy and then you don't have to do anything. Um, we have a few open access policies that I know of, and some of them are just not being implemented at all. They're, they're just there for, uh, for show. So uh, I think the key is to move things forward and create awareness. Now, in Alberta, I haven't heard of it in too many other places, but the big impetus for OER has been coming from students. And we have student groups in a student national uh, uh, provincial committee that has been pushing OER and lobbying the government uh, about OER and lobbying within their universities and with individual teachers to promote open educational resources. And I think that's been a very uh, powerful mover of, of OER in our province. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yes, I'm extremely skeptical of policy mm -hmm. and people spending a huge amount of time on policy uh, when implementation is called for. And uh, if you can implement and create your policy together, uh, I think you will have a robust policy and uh, a great implementation. Yes. I think that was very, very nice um, final words for this uh, session because uh, again, um, policies is not the goal as such. Uh, it is you have to go with the movement, uh, movement, and um, those people who are uh, in the uh, are for it, and, and then maybe policies are coming alongside. Uh, because again, uh, change is made by people, not by documents or policies or. <clears throat> So um, get the people with you. And I think uh, all the sessions uh, actually have uh, been uh, very much uh, showing that uh, to a very, very high extent, how important that is about um, awareness raising, about um, listening to people, about uh, see, see the benefits. And uh, your last words, uh, Rory, here as well, is uh, very important. Uh, um, show people that it, that, it, that it works, and then it will come. 
Um, I'm wondering, is, uh, are there any uh, urgent um, question to you, some of the presenters? We have still some uh, minutes uh, left. Uh, we have a very, very rich um, a conversation in the chat. Uh, as you know, you can um, um, copy the chat by those uh, three dots in the right corner. So you can save the conversation and the, and the links and um, everything. Uh, and I'm sure it will be also um, probably uploaded in, in, um, in uh, OE Global Connect. And I think also the conversation um, and dialogues will follow in the, in the uh, OE Connect um, area. So please um, take the opportunity to um, network, inter um, interact, and to discuss with each other, um, both during this week, but also um, uh, even after the conference and um, build your network. And uh, that is also uh, very important for, for advocacy and for um, moving, moving things forward. Um, so um, I would like to, if you still are there and if you like I would like to take a photo of, uh, of you of all of us so if it's possible to turn your camera uh, on if you like I would like to have a photo So smile. <laughs> Thank you. So by that, uh, it was a wonderful uh, session. It was uh, wonderful to meet all of you and to listen to uh, your insights and uh, your fantastic, wonderful initiatives. Uh, so keep going and um, um, we can all make the word to a better word for education and learning for all. So thank you very, very much and enjoy the rest of your conference and take care and stay safe wherever you are. And I hope we keep in contact in other places.